Okay, how's the how's the audio? Cool. Okay, because I'm I'm also I have a pretty loud voice, so if at any time you're like ah, just feel free to like do a hand gesture where you're like bring it down a little. That works for me. Cool. All right. So thanks so much for being here on Sunday. Uh, I know it's I know we I know we're starting a little later today, but uh, that does not mean we cannot get right into a heavy topic. So let's go ahead and do it. So the name of this talk is Now is Better Than Never, What the Zen of Python Can Teach Us About Data Ethics. By the way, I will tweet these slides. That is a link that, go, that goes to these slides, and I will upload it to my speaker deck after if you have questions, because I have a lot of content, and I have a lot of articles that are linked, so that if you are looking to maybe cross-reference some content I'm talking about, or you would like to dive deeper, it's all available at your fingertips. So cool. That's me. <laughs> so yeah. So so. Why am I here today talking about this? Well, I'm going to share a little bit about myself as I, as I kind of go through this topic today. But really, when it comes down to it, I think this is a topic that is really, really important that us as technologists really need to think about. Um, if you are looking to continue this conversation, again, I, I do participate on most social media platforms with, with that same handle. And yes, that is for O's, Lauren and Nicole. Um, but I'm, I, I do want to continue this, this dialogue with you. And I think this is a topic that we're all learning. We're all coming here together to approach it from different vantage points with our own lived experiences. And I think it's together by us talking that we can ideally help move the needle. So I do a lot with various communities in Chicago. I help with Pilates. I help with Python Software Foundation, um, at some other conferences like Write, Speak, Code. And all of that to say that a lot of the communities that I participate, one of the things I think that bubbles up to a lot of these, uh, to the top of the discussion in a lot of these groups is, you know, how do we as technologists change the world? What is the impact we're going to leave in the social spaces that we navigate and that we build? So the, 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 the place that I, I would like us to start is, well, obvious question. Why should we care about data ethics? That's, that's, a, that's a pretty heavy question. So maybe we can think of it from this vantage point. Every day, we're, we're generating about 2.5 billion new gigabytes of data. And that's a stat from 2012. And I tried to get, I was looking around looking for something more recent. But that, that, is, an, that is a lot of data. So we are, we are not only consuming more, but we're producing a lot more data. Our, our, our humans are getting online at earlier and earlier ages. This article is talking about how around age three, kids are averaging one up to three hours with a device on the internet. So not only are we producing a lot more data, but we as humans are functionally on the internet starting very, very early in life. So that, that said, is that a bad thing? I don't know. You ask me. Granted, <laughs> granted the internet does give us things like cats and the internet, which is actually a Wikipedia article. So obviously, the internet is not an evil, malicious actor. But there is a lot of things that we need to think about when it does come to how we use the tool, how we put tools into the world, and how it is that we think about how we think about the decisions we make as we create these tools. So some notes on this talk today. First thing, this is not supposed to be an answer or even the answer. This is, this is very much meant to be an exploratory kind of dialogue, presenting a framework for you to think about how data in, how data ethics impact and intersect with you as a technologist, be it as a user, be it as a, as a creator or consumer. But really, this is just meant to help us start thinking about some of the things and really start understanding what's happening in the world around us. Ideally, I'm hoping this conversation will help us start thinking about how we can start moving the needle in the right direction. So I understand that that is a very, very small font. But to kind of guide us through our experience, I thought, why not reference everyone's favorite then of Python, you know, import this. That's one of the first things you probably learn when you come to Python. One of the things I really enjoy about the Zen of Python is that it is not, uh, it is not mandating you to do a thing. There's a lot of contradictions even within the Zen of Python. But what the Zen of Python, I think, it does really well is it, it, it prescribes some aphorisms, but it's meant to be a philosophy. It's meant to be kind of a guiding tool to help us understand, in this context, as coders, what, is, what makes good, elegant code. Now applied to data ethics, I'm going to try to have some of the Zen of Python inform how we're going to break down this topic today. So let's start with complex is better than complicated. So where did this data ethics 
whole spiel come from? When we think of data ethics, is it a language of what's right or wrong? Is it our rights and responsibilities? Or is it something else? In short, the thing that I think when we need to think about data ethics is this three-pronged approach. So this is lifted from um, philosophical, philosophical transactions, and I thought it was a really good definition to help us think about the ways that we as technologists can understand data ethics. One being the ethics of data. That is, how is data generated, recorded, and shared? Another way we can think about it is the ethics of our algorithms. That is, how does AI, machine learning, and robots, how do they interpret, interpret data and make decisions in the world around us? And lastly, the ethics, the ethics of practice, devising responsible innovation and professional go, codes to guide this emerging science. So when we're talking about this today, we're going to be talking about the data itself, we're going to be talking about the algorithms, and we're actually going to be talking about the practices of how then we use these algorithms, we, we then use those algorithms to, to inform the world around us, and how we as technologists move forward in making decisions and building, building tools for people to use. So um, for those of you who may be newer to this conversation, I cannot recommend enough Kathy O'Neill's uh, Weapons of Math Destruction. It's kind of like the pop data science book that talks about some of the, some of the challenges that we're going to be going through in this, in this dialogue today. But I, I think right here, this quote kind of gets to the heart of this issue. Largely that data codifies the past. Additionally, that uh, Additionally, when it comes to big data, we have, to, we have to think about how we embed better values into our algorithms, and we really need to start thinking about how we put fairness ahead of profit. So these three things, again, data, practices, and the algorithms, those are gonna be the things that we're gonna be highlighting as we move forward. Another way you can think about this is uh, there's, a, there's a concept called uh, algorithms that, that distribute the sensible. That is, when we have so much data that no one human can sit in front of it and shift shift through all that data, we have to create algorithms to make decisions for us. Our algorithms are now deciding what is sensible and what is not sensible. So that's all good and dandy, but how does that impact me? So how I got started as a technologist, around 2008, I joined Obama for America in the, uh, in the campaign headquarters in Chicago. For anyone who may have been politically inclined or paying attention at that time, you may remember that th this was really coinciding with the rise of social media. That campaign, if you can remember all the stickers, like insert the blank for Obama, there's a lot of customization that was happening. Ariana Huffington, I think, nailed it when she says, were it not for the internet, Barack Obama would not be the president. This campaign was incredibly rev revolutionary in the way that it engaged millennials, really targeting 18 to 34 year olds, and the way that it used social media to personalize these messages and essentially apply data science to a political campaign. That did not happen before. This, this was only 10 years ago. So uh, the, the former uh, data scientist, chief data scientist under uh, President Obama, DJ Patil, when he describes like what data science is, he says, you know, that, that concept, that term, really didn't get coined until 2008. So there really is an intersection here with that campaign, particularly how I have understood what data science is and again, this is a relatively new concept. It's about 10 years. For those of you who may not be a data science practitioner and you go Google something, you might see this Venn diagram. It's like in every single data science talk, I swear. But this idea that there's computer science, there's math, subject area expertise, and right in the middle is supposed to be this data science unicorn, well, that doesn't really exist, right? But, <laughs> but what data science does allude to is how we are drawing from all these other disciplines to inform this thing that we call data science. So the examples I'm going to be talking about when it comes to data ethics, I will be taking the vantage point of saying a lot data science. So I did want to make sure that we highlight a little bit where does data science come from, how, how long has that concept been around, and also what, what kind of subject areas or skills do people have if they are data science practitioners. So the first example that I would like to walk through um, in the special cases aren't special enough to break the rules is looking at censorship and cyberbullying in social media. I'm just gonna sit and let you take some of that in. These are headlines that have come from the past year. And these all link, again, on my slides, these all link back to the original content. 
So, yeah, there's a lot happening in the world around us right now. Rose McGowan is an actress who was talking about uh, basically vocalizing her experience of what was happening in Hollywood around the Me Too moment. And one of the things that happened when she was sharing her experience is actually Twitter shut down her account for a while. A lot of people were really upset. They didn't understand why that was happening. And in the dialogue you can see here, basically what had happened is the actress apparently had shared a personal or private phone number, and that is a big no-no. So as they walk through kind of explaining why there was this, uh, why there was this shut down of her account for a period of time. They said that's, that's in direct violation of our terms of service, and we don't, we don't stand for that. So social media, the problem, with, the problem when it comes to social media and the experience of cyberbullying or the experience of censorship is all of our social media platforms operate incredibly differently. So Reddit versus Twitter versus Wikipedia. For example, consider Wikipedia. There's a, a data corpus called the Detox Project, which looks at all of the authors who contribute articles to Wikipedia. And essentially, people going around and editing other people's articles can leave a comment for someone who writes an article. So they started, so, so when we think about social, that is actually a social experience on Wikipedia. So you have to be a registered, you, you do have to have a registered account. You do have a name associated with it. But that's very different than if you look at Reddit, which these are quasi-autonomous, self-regulating communities that do not require a name associated with your legal name and can provide a lot of, and uh, can, can allow you to maybe present yourself as someone that you aren't. Then, it, then if we look at Twitter, Twitter, open, open platform, anyone can sign up to join. Again, all of these platforms are intersecting with social differently. And so this makes it very difficult for us to combat cyberbullying and for us to think about what does censorship mean and how do we actually decide what to censor and how to censor. So in the, in the space of cyberbullying, there's kind of two big things that pop up. Um, you may have heard about, um, you may have heard of the term trolling or flaming, and I'll walk through that. But broadly speaking, when, when we talk about cyberbullying, the definition of it is meant, um, basically focuses a lot on deliberate, hostile, repeated events the repetition and the intent are really big things when it comes to cyberbullying. So the, as I alluded to, the kind of patterns that you may hear trolling or flaming. Trolling is when you may be using really, really angry language or very violent language towards someone, whereas um, the, the term flaming is meant to imply that you, you are perhaps doxing someone or sharing personal, linking personal information about someone. So when we're, when we're thinking about how to answer this question in social media, you can ask the question from, you know, the, the note, the, from the vantage point of how do we identify the offender? So for example, is the responding party a, a cyber bully? If we're now looking at that instead of saying we want to identify the, the offender, but instead say I want to identify instances of cyber, cyber bullying, then you, have to, you might write a data science model that says what's the likelihood a conversation is, is cyber bullying? Is this conversation aggressive? Is it not? At what level do you consider something to be aggressive? So again, we can have a whole umbrella of questions to think about how we, we would build a model to go and detect what cyberbullying is in social media. It's a very complex problem. Another, another thing that also happens when, with uh, cyberbullying in general is, um, so this came out about last year. There was a lot of traction around how cyberbullying, um, or rather, how, how can you report something? And then who is the people who are actually reviewing content? Because if you are on social, you can say, hey, this, this content is aggressive, or this, this content doesn't belong here. When it gets flagged and it gets sent off, what happens? And that's kind of what this, this article goes into. So something that was pretty disturbing around this, with Facebook in particular, when, when that content gets flagged, it's sent to a third party, uh, third party uh, contracting service. And you are going through perhaps a minute per piece of content you don't have any of the context, and you're going through and saying, yes, this is, yes, is cyberbullying, no, it's not. And the volume of content that you're going through, imagine eight hours a day going through and just reviewing all this content, and you might be spending a, a minute on each piece of content. That can be probably very, very damaging. And I, I, I don't even want, I, I think the mental health concern here is very real. Because then additionally, what happens with these moderators 
that the kind of catch-22 and the irony here is these weren't considered full-time employees, so they didn't get the benefits of a full-time Facebook employee, so they didn't have the option to have the great insurance, maybe the access to the, the, to, to the mental health services that some of these people may need. So again, cyberbullying from the, you know, how do we write the model to do it to whose eyes are actually the ones that's consuming and, and, and whose mind or whose mental health is, is being exposed here or possibly damaged, there's a lot of, there's a lot of ethical concerns here. So historically, when we think of cyberbullying, as I was saying, you might have content moderation via the product owner, you might have it by, by the user, via user feedback, but in short, these approaches just really, they don't scale well. We have a lot of data, they may not be, they can be gravely inefficient, and just in general, if you look at this, at this question, the, the, platforms that are, uh, the platforms upon which social media happens, they haven't answered this question. It's a, it's a really big problem, but yet we've created tools that allow these experiences to happen, and we don't know how to answer these, these conundrums and these problems. So I think, the thing that I, that I, think, I think the thing that we need to ask ourselves is, when no one human or computer can shift through all this content and social media and all this content online, what's the risks when we are just allowing something to automate and process this? What, what risks do we make when we create a platform where we don't even know how to properly respond to incidents as they arise. So the example here is not meant to take any particular position, but in the space of how Rose McGowan was censored, some people started raising the question around, well, if you, if you start thinking about how other people use social media, like what is aggression? Can we, to one person this may be aggressive, to another this may not be aggressive. And I think the theme that we start to see over and over again is d data science allows us to automate away solutions to problems, but then for some people, they get to be the special case where maybe they aren't being policed by that, by that data science model, by that algorithm. So when it comes to social, we see, a lot of, we see a lot of problems. No two people agree on what aggression is. No two people will have the entire definitions in front of them. And this is a problem that's mounting and scaling and has very real impact. Because the other thing to think about with, with cyberbullying is it, it does have a very, very big risk for young people and can have very, very damaging mental health impacts. So that's our first example. <laughs> Second example, errors should never pass silently. Predictive policing. So I'm gonna use Chicago as an example for this, which is where I'm from. Um, in uh, early 2017, Mayor Rahm announced there's going to be a new initiative uh, for the Chicago Police Department and how they were going to be com combating violent crime. Specifically, they were going to be enabling this thing called predictive policing. What that meant is they were going to use data and analysis to identify neighborhoods that are more likely to experience violent crime. Additionally, they're going to identify people who are expected to become victims and criminals. The part in this article that I, that I just had to pause and think about was when I read the, in this article where it said, officers may even be assigned to visit the people that they think are going to commit crimes to warn them against committing violent crime. Minority report? <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, it, but the, the reality in Chicago is there are some communities that, that do struggle with, with violent crime. Not, I'm not trying to suggest that we don't need to think differently about how we respond to these things, but when we start doing predictive policing, who wins and who loses there? So um, kind of continuing in this, some other things that have happened in Chicago includes um, essentially for every person who has been arrested, an algorithm was created to assign people a, numer a numerical threat score from from number one all the way up to 500 plus. In practicality, these personalized threat scores, you know, how, how, they, were, how they were decided, what that means, my understanding is that this is kind of a black, a black box method in that you don't get to go back and question how that score was generated. You do have some understanding of what is considered violent crime and what kind of data is available. But going back and kind of asking like, what does that score mean? And how can I question what that score actually how, how that score was arrived at. My understanding is this is a black box model. Additionally, with this model, 
and the, 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 the score that you get generated, Chicago Police Department actually, if you pull someone over and you have a score generated, it's actually visible on the dashboard when they pull you over. <laughs> so now not only are we, now not only are we predicting who's gonna become the victim and who's gonna become the criminal, but now we're using other models to generate these, to generate these, these potential risk scores, throwing them up on a dashboard when someone's being pulled over. I, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure if that's a good thing. I, I think that just seems highly problematic. So this, 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 um, this is called a strategic subjects list and is colloquially, colloquially known in Chicago as the heat list. So if that's not enough, this just happened a few, three days ago, I believe. Anyone hear about this? Recognition? Yeah. So the thing, that, the, thing that's, uh, the thing that's kind of problematic with this, so essentially the ACLU went, got Amazon's face recognition software recognition with a G, no, with a K, there you go, with a recognition, and the default is set to 80% confidence. That is, how confident are you in the answer that you're gonna get back being correct or not? The, they, they have the default setting at 80, which is what the ACL used when they went and they uploaded the photos of United States congressmen, and they found that when they got the 28 matches, there's 40% of those that are congressmen of color. Now Amazon responded saying, well hey, we actually recommend everyone to have a 95% or higher confidence score, so you shouldn't be using 80%, so I don't know, you're bad. So, so when, when you do actually up the needle, this actually does not, it's not as problematic with the way it's, it's scoring people, but the defaults that come out of the box aren't for people who may just be consuming this and maybe not reading all the documentation, because I will admit, I don't read all the documentation, and that, I think that's probably, I think everyone here is a little guilty of that at some point, but this kind of thing just, it, it's just not, it's not acceptable. As if that wasn't enough. <laughs> um, additionally, the ACLU recently brought suit against the Chicago Police Department in June 2018 about social media monitoring software. So they, in, the, in this brief, they actually list a whole bunch of software that they find to be suspicious and suspect. Um, but the big thing that, one of the big names that kept popping up is this name, Geofidia. And Geofidia is known to have actually allowed people to, so that you, use, uh, you use keywords and you use hashtags to kind of understand if someone um, might be like a threat. Well, when people were protesting, and, have, and we've had a lot of um, activists uh, we've had a lot of a activist activity in the last few years, including Black Lives Matter. That was actually one of the hashtags that Geofidia was recommending you can use to track people um, because it, it was suspected that perhaps activists are going to more likely be violent or we, we want to understand what's happening there. So this, this goes even deeper than that. It's, it's not known what software the Chicago Police Department is using. Is Geofidia is one they understood from 2014 to 2016, actually was in use, but there's a whole bunch of other ones when it comes to understanding what social media software, uh, tracking software you're using, for what intent, why. So back to social media, again, predictive policing combined with social media, we continue to see these, these, these flare-ups happen. So in, in, in general, I think it's really important to say that now is better than never for us to really start thinking about how we can inform real change. We're the people that write the code. We're the people who collect the data. We can change this. That's what I would, I, that's what I really want people to start thinking about. So in February of this year, you may have heard about, uh, you may have heard about this data science kind of code of ethics but broadly speaking, it's meant to be a code of ethics for anyone who's a data practitioner. That is, if you're consuming, using, doing stuff with data, we, have, we want you to start thinking about a code of ethics. So this code of ethics in February kind of got kicked off by folks like CJ Patil, as I mentioned earlier. Um, Bloomberg is a part of, the, is part of the consortium. And the idea is in the medical community, the Hippocratic Oath, basically, you know, you're not gonna 
not treat someone, you're going to give the same, you're going to offer the same medical assistance to all people regardless of creed, those kind of things. That guiding light is understood to have been a really Im impactful and important thing in the medical community. So where this dialogue starts is trying to think about, you know, maybe we can start modeling some of that and bringing that into our communities. So that's where this conversation starts. If you're curious and want to know more about this, this is a conversation that's happening. Uh, there's a Slack for Data for Democracy you can go join. And they have all of their work happening on GitHub. So you can go and start thinking about what are some of the ethics that, that may be useful from the point of bias will exist, measure it, plan for it. You know, does that make sense? This has received a little, a little pushback. Some people think that a code, of, a code of ethics or a code of conduct, so to speak, while admirable, it's not really putting any real mechanisms and any real mechanisms in place to prevent people from actually continuing to do bad things. They may say, oh, well, I thought about it. I did my part, but whatever. So there is a lot, there is, this is a conversation that, again, got kicked off in February. And there is, I, I've seen a lot of people on both sides of the fence on this. And I'm not sure, I'm not sure where the conversation is going to go next. But right now, it is trying, it's at the point where, where people are trying to think about what things do we need to start agreeing to and how. So I think when it comes to, when it comes to things that we can start doing, broad strokes, there's some really easy wins. For example, explore and understand your data. Explore your errors. Make your results interpretable. So like I said, that black box model that, that's giving the, the, risk, the risk score that Chicago Police Department is using, maybe, maybe that's not the thing you want to give. Maybe there's another way to like present that information um, that allows people to really understand what the context of that is and engage with it deeper. And lastly, if you, if you don't know something, find someone that does. So Deborah Hanaus gave this advice in her PyCon Columbia keynote. And I really, I really like number four, just in general. Back to that Venn diagram of what data science is. Allegedly, this unicorn in the middle where you know all the computer science, you know all the math and stats, and you know all of this area subject expertise. <laughs> that exists within a team of people. Not, not, maybe, there, maybe there's some people who they have that all. But likely, we're all trying to learn together, right? So think about how you can reach out to people who are the stakeholders, who are the users. How do we incorporate them into our software? How do we incorporate them into our, into our build process? What does that look like for us? Another project that I think is pretty interesting is the data set nutrition label. So this comes out of MIT Media Lab. And essentially, what they're trying to do is generate this. So you know when you go and you eat something, like I've got my bottle of water, it, it will tell me some information on the back about nutrition facts. What they're trying to think about is, well, what kind of statistically significant measures can we provide in a universal label that allows people to easily go and say, OK, if I'm going to use this public data set, like, well, like where did this data come from? Who collected it? What, what's the bias? What kind of bias measurements do we have? And things like that. So I think that's a really interesting project. And I think it's a, it's, I think it's a way for us to think about how that we can do some of that archaeology in the data sets that we use. You may be in an organization where maybe, maybe you don't buy external data sets. But you can also start kind of looking at this project to see what kind of things they're calling out and they're highlighting as things you need to think about when you're kind of measuring what is the variance in your data, what actually is ground level truth. A tool that you can use to help you get deeper into that, the facets tool, allows you to go in and do deep, deeper dives and visualizations to understand the complexities of your data set. This is a project that came out of Harvard, MIT Media Lab, and a few other groups who are part of this. But it's pretty awesome. I, I think you all should go check this out. But again, just quick, quickly being able to throw data set in there, understand the shape of your data, what's in there, what's not. So you can start making a call on, is this a thing I should be using, yes or no. Additionally, a, a thing that you can also think about, because maybe, again, maybe you're not in the place where, uh, maybe you're not in the place where you're buying public data sets. 
Think about how, as you're collecting data in your, in your teams to do things, what, what is the entire data lifecycle? What does that look like? So one, one example I can think of is, you know, we have startups. Maybe for some reason the startup doesn't, they're, they're, they ran out of funding, but they collected all this data. Maybe they're doing something like uh, regulations work, uh, where you have to, if, for example, if you work in finance, you have to comply with the SEC, and you're doing all this, compl all this compliance work. And maybe some of this work that you're doing allows you to collect some proprietary information about different financial groups that you're working with. Perhaps that startup runs out of money, no more, no more business. What, what you can see happen is people will actually take the valuable things, that, that is their data, and they may go and they sell it to another group. So the problems there that then start to happen with once you've collected something from that original, from that original use case and then it gets reappropriated into something else, that then allows us to start have to start having these problems where maybe as maybe when you started measuring whatever it was you were measuring initially, once you change the context, that ground truth isn't the same. So when when you think about your data policy, it is important not only how you collect how you collect it, how you use it, but also what happens at the end. Do you do you destroy your data? Do you actually say, hey, we're not going to go and sell if we go under? Like what what does that mean? Um, Google has the data liberation project which actually allows you to go and download all the data that Google has on you for various products. Not all Google products are maintained, but some other people are getting into this to at least say, hey, if you want to understand what we have, on, like what data we've collected on you, here you go, you can, you can go and download it. So I've seen people kind of coming about it at various ways, but there's a whole life cycle and a whole life flow that we need to start thinking about, and if we don't have those practices in place, why don't we? What's the barrier of entry there? How can we start moving that needle? So in short, that's kind of the, the, a little bit about data ethics. It's your practices, it's the algorithms, and it's the data itself. We have a lot of tools that we've created in the world with a lot, a lot of challenges, and we're, not, we're, we're gonna mess up, and that's okay. But in the process of, in the process of that, can we go and look at, look at why, why we failed, understand, where that failure came from, and then allow ourselves to reflect, build new practices, and move forward. A lot of these projects that I mentioned at the end are actively looking for people to work on them. So when I tweet these out, I encourage you to go check them out, go contribute. Start learning all these things. Bring these conversations back to your dev teams. Start thinking about them, because it's, it's, only, gonna, it's only together that we're gonna start making these changes and really allowing ourselves to be held accountable. So if you want to ask any questions, I'm super happy to do that in the hall. That being said, I appreciate your time this morning, and I'll be tweeting my slides right after this.